IDBM Challenge Season 1 Episode 1 What do you do when the odds are against you? What about tackling nearly impossible challenges? Find out more in today's episode and find ways for you to become the hero of your own life. Yeah, I already had the pleasure to talk with you about uh, your challenges which you have been take facing and also choosing in life and um, how you have approached them with a lot of sisu, mm -hmm. which you will also introduce uh, in our, our upcoming minutes of talk. Yeah. Um, and to give the students and the listeners or the watchers uh, a certain background, would you like to give us a small intro about where you're coming from. Mm, so a bit about my background. I guess the usual labels that we people like to use is about you know our educational background. And so uh, my background is in applied positive psychology and social psychology. And I'm currently working on a PhD um, that is focused on understanding how humans exceed themselves. Um, I work a lot with trauma survivors. Um, but most importantly, I would say that what is in the center of my life is to, you know, be a fellow human on this planet to other humans, um, find ways to add some kind of warm, positive value to people's lives, and most importantly, create safe spaces, psychological safety. Um, because we know from research, and I'm sure we all have anecdotes and experiences of how we become more alive when we are with people who kind of hold that space for us, instead of putting us in a place where we have to be all the time succeeding and we have to say the right thing every single second. You know, it's not a normal state for a human. You know, we learn through these little tests and tryouts and I really see life as a sequence and series of experiences and experiments. So yeah, a traveler, researcher, runner. <laughs> That's how I define myself. It is a very interesting background also regarding towards our course and our challenge mm -hmm. where people need to, well, focus on a really big and ambitious aim, which mm -hmm. is very ambiguous and, mm -hmm. um, well, they should, should care about themselves and also about their team mm -hmm. to create exactly such an environment. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I know that you are doing this um, multi-runs. It's multi-run, right? Oh. Multi-run, ultra-run. Ultra-run, ultra -run. yeah. yeah. The ultra-runs, <laughs> sorry. So the ultra-runs, um, which need an oppressive amount of of self-courage and of courage and to, to actually do that, you know, keep running and keep mm -hmm. being up. And um, we had talked earlier about the topic to, to dream big. And this is, to me, kind of a big achievement, a, a big dream. Mm -hmm. um, and you said that on your runs, which you have achieved so, or you have done so far, um, you have learned a lot from other professionals out there who are also pushing their boundaries yeah. um, about how to how to treat yourself within this dreaming big and yeah. entering these ambiguous situations. Do you want? After now, I talked for five minutes. Uh, <laughs> tell us something. <laughs> Some, some more insights about what you have experienced and learned yeah. about? Um, I think some of the most important lessons and learnings have to do with uh, rather maybe counterintuitively, uh, not to mental toughness and pushing hard, but actually to self-kindness and um, to being happy with not being perfect, mm -hmm. uh, embracing your imperfections and also allowing yourself to um, go at the pace that actually is comfortable for you at a time. So something that we do in ultra running, I don't know if everyone does this, but this is how I do my ultra runs, uh, is that I walk most of the uphills every single time, because all the time you have to keep in mind that it's a, it's a long distance um, endurance endeavor, which is also like life is. You know, life is an ultra event, not a sprint. And very often we get caught up in the moment, you know, and we feel like we have to do everything and we have to get it right. We have to give like our most perfect contribution every single moment. But 
I think a more healthy way, um, you know, we can also look at athletes. Are you a fit athlete or are you a healthy athlete? You know? mm. And if you want to be a healthy athlete, you keep in mind that tomorrow is a new day, um, next week is a new day. Uh, the run that you alluded to is this 2,400 kilometer, 50 ultra marathons in 50 days thing across New Zealand uh, mm. next, next year, early next year. And so doing a thing like that, you have to be very patient with yourself. And I think um, walking up hills is a beautiful metaphor for those moments when we feel very challenged and we feel that we're running out of energy is that when you feel a slight uphill, it's okay to slow down your pace, mm. you know? Because it's like my friend Anastina, who's an ultra runner, she says that it's wasted energy to try to fight that um, gravity, you know? Like you, if you run the uphills, you're gonna get your heart rate super high and it's gonna take you longer to recover. So kindness in that sense and just becoming attuned uh, to your body. Um, which are all things that translate to real life as well when we are at school, with our families, uh, with whoever it is. So it really comes down to honoring yourself. And this is something that I heard from Mark Allen, who's a six-time Ironman world champion. So that's a person who we could imagine is super tough. But mm. when I met him, um, he's Sisu. So in Finland, we have this word Sisu that translates as, you know, it doesn't have a direct translation, but you could describe it as having determination and courage in the face of adversity. So it's something that happens in the moment mm. when we feel that we've consumed our mental or physical capacities, and then we find something almost like a second wind somewhere within us. Mm. This is like strength and power that emerges. Um, so Mark Allen's Sisu does not come from self-punishment, um, being hard, but it actually comes from this place of kindness. And he told me that, Amelia, it's so important to honor yourself, you know, and um, th that means that you set boundaries, uh, you treat yourself with good nutrition, you don't uh, run faster than you should in a moment, which again translates to real life as well, that sometimes we need to slow down when there's too much to do. But it also means that we select carefully the people who are around us. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a saying that we are the sum of maybe six or eight people who are in our closer inner circle. So it's very important that the people we spend most time with are people who hold a safe space for us. Um, and that we also should aspire to be people like that to the humans who are in our close vicinity. Hmm. Yeah. Should let that rest for a second. <laughs> yeah, that was a long answer. <laughs> But it was a very good answer, like, because I, I do believe you are very much right in many things, like, uh, like, well, of course, otherwise I wouldn't talk to you maybe today <laughs> about the topic. Like, I, I want to, to share this point of view, because I have heard many times that, um, especially students, the smartest ones, they are elite, they are the hardest ones on themselves, yeah. uh, that ends up in depression very often, yeah. in complete stress and knockout, burnout. So, yeah, it's it's important to remember you are the you are the biggest resource you have got. So yes. treat it like gold. It's really <laughs> like, well treat it really well. Yeah. And but you also mentioned um, the resource of your peers around you and others around you. Um, I really much like when you said, "Yeah, surround yourself with the ones who who are kind to you or who make you feel good." Of course, it does not mean that there shouldn't be any challenge. Also, friction can be sometimes enriching, yeah. but it should be always in a maybe in a healthy yeah. amount. Constructive. Not, yeah, constructive and not destructive. Yeah. And um, do you have some in or like some conclusions for yourself or some insights when dealing with with interpersonal um, communication? In, in such tough situations or in teamwork or in big challenges? Mm -hmm. I guess number one thing would be to approach the other person with um, curiosity. We all have a lot of resources and ideas and we have, all have a lot to give. But in order for us to sometimes get those ideas out, mm -hmm. um, it requires a certain environment where we feel that not every single word is being kind of 
checked, you know, or validated, uh, whether it's right or wrong. So it's very important to look for the good, look for the good in the other person. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I have a friend here who also is here at Alto University, Peter Kenta, and he used to play soccer. Uh, I don't know if he still plays, but I still remember when he told me this example of his old soccer coach who said before a really important game that, hey, listen team, your number one goal here is to make the other, the team player look good. <laughs> like that's kind of where you should, how you should approach this thing. Mm. And, and, um, and I argue that if we approach situations with other people more from that angle, not from what we need or what we want, but more from a place of being other focused, we naturally as a side product, we get a space where we also flourish because we are able to build those bridges to other people. When we show other humans compassion, uh, they reciprocate, you know, so there is this mirroring effect that happens and we're able to build relationships um, that prime us for, you know, succeeding in those goals that we set for ourselves. So that's something that I try to keep in mind. And it's also okay that we go through bad days, you know, and when you are going through that day, it's, you know, an important thing is to communicate, you know. There's this, uh, I often say during my speeches that which were the species that survived, in, you know, in evolution. There were the species that learned how to communicate with one another. So if we're having a bad day, you can say that, you know, I'm not in my 100%, I'm mm -hmm. having a bad day. So communication and just trying your best to kind of see things from the point of view of the other person. And if you still constantly feel that you are less than you could be in the presence of a group of people or some people, I would say that you might want to check whether you should be in that group, you know. Mm -hmm. I do a lot of work with nonviolence. Um, I run a campaign that is all about creating a culture of zero tolerance to abuse of any kind. And in that context, I would say that, you know, part ways with those who diminish you. You know, mm -hmm. it's a really, this is an important thing and it's sometimes very hard to set boundaries. Mm -hmm. But that's one of the biggest lessons I've, le I've learned in my own life. That if you're not feeling well around certain people, well, you know, maybe you should do a little check-in, you know, whether you should be there or not. So. So it's good to take care of one another and ourselves. Yeah, I think this, especially the communication part, like you have to communicate. Um, I personally, when I arrived in Finland, it was like a tough thing for me to figure out how do, oh God. How do you communicate <laughs> within that international communication coming from Germany where it's a very explicit communication. Yeah. Mm. Arriving in Finland, where it's a very implicit communication, uh, to my point of view. Yeah. Um, but it's not just Finland. It's like mm, we have here in our studies, we have like nation, like from all the nations, people coming. Uh, come from India, from America, from France. There are like there are the native speakers and the non-native speakers. So there is a lot out there, mm -hmm. and finding a common agreement or like a common understanding of how to communicate. Mm. Mm. seems important mm. to me also to to test hey yeah this is what you you know say what you think and you see will it be too much or then somebody like me shut up for like four breathes of before you say something because you will just overwhelm an introvert not mm. talking <laughs> so that might be something yeah you know i sometimes say that because communication, you know, we can fail at it, we can be in a bad mood and someone, you know, might feel that they're too much in our face and whatever it is. And I think you mentioned something about common ground and kind of just finding that. And that can even be just thinking about the humanity of the other person. Because mm. we are still the same species living on this planet and kind of relating to the humanness of, of the other, other person who's kind of peering to you, you know, from those mm -hmm. two eyes and has gone through a journey. And I once heard someone say that, you know, in the world, there isn't a human, if you hear their story, that you can't sympathize with. Mm -hmm. So in those moments when someone is being super annoying, you can even focus on that, that human has a story, you know, which I don't know about, mm -hmm. you know, and because we tend to mirror one another. So if 
someone sends negative energy to you, it's very natural for kind of like to respond to it by like being a little bit defensive. But if in that moment you're able to a little bit kind of ease into it, like mm. in Aikido, when you don't resist energy, but you just kind of let it go where it's naturally flowing, mm. in many ways, in many cases, you can actually um, avoid that conflict. And this doesn't mean that you have to become some floor rug who's just running away, but you kind of stand your ground, mm. but um, you see where the energy is going. And, and many times I've actually seen that kind of a situation that could have been potentially very difficult turn into a positive um, encounter with someone. I mean, we all have this deep yearning to be accepted and loved. So mm. that's the base premise of being a human. Even someone who might seem very um, unapproachable, they often even need it more, you know, so. Yeah, but picking up on the individual layer of yourself, like, well, being kind to yourself, yeah, that's that's an aspect. Mm -hmm. um, you have mentioned the inner narrative, which is basically also what kind of story are you giving yourself? Mm -hmm. um, do you want to share some, some more insights for our students so they can maybe use it even in their upcoming big challenge of this master study? Yeah, you yeah, know, it's actually, it's a very, in my own personal life, it's been one of these huge discoveries um, to become aware of the just the idea that we have an inner narrative it's like an inner inner radio station that's on some it's playing some kind of background music and you can hear it when you succeed especially when you succeed or when you fail so to speak if you want to use the word failure but when we don't perform as we wished you know as we hoped so if you kind of dial in a little bit in that moment you can almost hear whose voice it is because we pick up these ideas and tones throughout our lifetime it's like that sticky fly paper that you like put in the ceiling and then everything gets stuck on it so in the same way you know it can be a narrative from our childhood a voice of our parents or an ex-boyfriend girlfriend or some friend teacher and um and why this is so important is that so our conscious mind it processes about 50 kilobytes per second of information. So it's pretty much like what I see now here. It's like how much I can, you know, everything else is a blur around me. Uh, but what's happening underneath all this is that our subconscious mind, it is able to process about 10 million kilobytes per second. Mm -hmm. So I don't know who ca calculated how much it is, but I mean, the difference is massive. And why this is important is that all that material that is not in our conscious level, it's still influencing our thoughts, which then our thoughts manifests, uh, manifest through our actions and behaviors, which are the visible side of our inner world. And as long as that um, material is impacting us completely, you know, we are kind of like punching balls, bags, you know, that we react and we act from fear, we act from um, of, from you know, be, we're defensive, you know. Mm -hmm. But when we learn to dial in in those moments when we feel threatened or when we feel exhaustion, we can take that little tiny moment uh, to reflect. And uh, for example, like what Viktor Frankl, this late psychiatrist, said, that um, between a stimulus and a response, there is a tiny space. And we can choose, in that tiny space, we can choose our behavior and our actions. And in that space, in a way, kind of lies our freedom. Mm. Uh, so we, being species with highly developed frontal lobe, which gives us the um, ability to choose the way we think. Mm. And it's uh, a freedom that we should use more. Um, but it comes with this awareness of the fact that we have all these thoughts running uh, in our head all the time. And it relates to this inner narrative that we have about ourselves. Am I good? Uh, am I worthy? Am I enough just the way I am? And this is something that I've struggled with a lot. Um, I've had a very um, tough inner narrative, um, especially as a leftover of this relationship that I was in, which was emotionally and physically abusive, which then led me to start this campaign called Season of Silence, which is about nonviolence and compassion. So there are still leftovers from that relationship that I'm processing sometimes and, and you know, trying to get out. 
And the thing is that the story we tell ourselves becomes our reality and our truth. So that's why it's important to take a little bit of time to kind of think what is it that we think about ourselves. And that's how we can also start changing it slowly, like the, tra the radio station. It'll take a while, but uh, it is doable and we can actually we can get to a place where there's more of a kind tone in our inner voice. Yeah, and I think you now said take the time to actually reflect on it. And mm -hmm. I think that is something which is very often missed nowadays. So to actually say, hey, I'm gone for a week. I'm just with myself. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I switch off my WhatsApp and my mobile and I'm just with myself. Yes. And it's this constant media input and absorbing all the things around you but yeah. then you left you forget kind of yourself yes so, yeah. i love that you mentioned that i mean there's so much stuff and i would say crap that's being bombarded yeah um like straight in our face into our consciousness that we don't we don't have enough time for just like this stream of consciousness just like emerging you know of like what is it that we're really feeling and what is it that we're really thinking about things when it's constantly being cut by like a little message and input from here and there. And most of it is very trivial. You know, it's not information that we need. Yeah, I think for our small insights, we are, we have covered a fair bit of topics. Um, I hope that the students and also the listeners will take some of these lessons and experiences you have, you have gathered and also processed and will remind themselves from time to time, hey, be kind to yourself or take a step back and just think about what's important for yourself. Yeah, and honor yourself. You know, I think that's a good takeaway to take for a busy semester, is that no matter what happens, it's still uh, to put things in perspective. You know, not to take yourself too seriously, not even the thing that you're doing, because at the end of the day, we most likely have this one life, we have this one moment, and if it doesn't feel joyful, then it's good to... Because we have to work hard, of course. I know that I work hard myself as well. But if it constantly feels like a drag, well, maybe it's a good idea to go talk to someone. Um, talk to a friend. Talk to someone who does that as a profession. But the number one thing is not to be left alone with whatever it is that is going on. And, um, and then when it feels good, you know, put some little bit more gas on and just like enjoy the ride. But uh, doing all that from this place of honoring yourself and just accepting what is, what are the emotions in a given moment. So whether it's positive or negative, everything is part of the human experience. Yeah, very true. So I will close this interview. In the worst case, the world <laughs> will keep on turning. Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. somehow helps me every day to yeah. keep going no matter what stress is on the table. Yeah. So I think that resonates very much with what you've just said. Nice. Yeah. I agree. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. <laughs> <Woo>! <laughs>